Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Sarah Kanza, the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed interviews co-hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. In this series, UC Berkeley archaeologists and others who work with archaeological materials discuss their research and answer audience questions. For those of you who are joining live today, you may ask a question in the live chat box, which you should see to the right of the video or, to, or below the video in YouTube. So today we're um, happy to have with us Martha Nuno Diaz Longo, who is going to talk about using bioarchaeological methods to aid in humanitarian efforts of undocumented border crossers at the US-Mexico border. Uh, Martha is a third year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Her area of concentration is bioarchaeology. She's part of the Skeletal Biology Lab Laboratory under the mentorship of Dr. Sabrina Agarwal. At the PhD level, Martha hopes to address questions regarding structural violence and how said violence can be seen on the skeleton, especially of those who attempt to cross the US-Mexico border. Skeletal evidence and understanding of structural violence can aid in the understanding of an individual's life course, leading to a better understanding of the circumstances um, leading to who were exposed to this type of violence and why they may have ultimately decided to cross such a treacherous border. Martha hopes to continue applying bioarchaeological methods to these issues in order to delve into the humanitarian aspect involved with this crisis. So thank you very much for joining us, Martha, yeah. and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. Thank you for having me. And um, if you would just, um, if you just want to start off by telling us a bit about your research, um, I understand you have some slides that you can that you can walk through with us. Okay, so I am going to start screen sharing very quickly. There we are. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I know this is a weird time for everybody. So you know, hopefully with you know these talks, you know it's been kind of a, a break in the monotony of things. Um, so today I really wanted to talk to you guys about kind of my, my own research in the past and my ongoing research, um, which I think is incredibly important given, you know, the current political turmoil that's going on um, right now and that has been going on for quite some time um, and how scientific aspects of it in bioarchaeology can really aid in, in helping these individuals, not only when they're deceased, but also when they're alive. So I really quickly wanted to show you guys this map. Now this I got online from Humane Borders. Um, anybody could log on, it's open access. And basically what this map is showing us here, we can see um, the Mexico border. Um, I don't know if you guys could see my mouse, but uh, it's right here. And here we have, you know, of course, uh, California over here, Arizona. And what I wanted to point out is these red dots that you see are markers indicating migrant deaths. Now, this doesn't just mean one death. These are clusters of deaths of uh, people of 10 or more. So all these dots you're seeing is not necessarily a single individual, it's various individuals. And the reason I bring this up is because I really want us to get a sense of how big this issue is and just how many lives are lost and why this is such a big issue that needs to be addressed um, in the humanitarian realm, as well as um, in bioarchaeology, because I do feel bioarchaeology, bioarchaeologists have an amazing toolkit that they can use to address these issues. And they could really um, impact and influence policy, as well as like laws that can come in place that can help protect individuals um, on both sides of the border. So that was just kind of a quick landscape that I wanted to show everybody. So there, there is a better idea of the area we're looking at and the geographical landscape of it as well. So here, of course, we're, is another map. It's not a satellite image. Um, here, I really wanted to point out how complex this landscape can be. I know in archeology, span we often talk about cultural landscapes, social landscapes, geographical landscapes. And just for example, here, we have federally recognized tribes um, in green. So, with this in mind, I really want us to take into account how big of an issue this is. It's not only affecting United States citizens, people from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, wherever they're migrating from, it's also affecting tribal people in their, in their native lands. Um, Cause we do see some deaths along the border, like for example, in the Tohono O'odham Nation. So it, it is very complicated. It's, 
it's a very twisted web. Um, there's many people working on this issue, not only on the landscape side, on the repatriation side, on the humanitarian side, on policy making, on funding. It's a plethora of people really coming together given the complexity of this issue. So again, these are just background maps for us to kind of get in the headspace of the complexities here that we're gonna to have to be dealing with as bioarchaeologists. So where do I come in? How does my work work here? What have I done in the past? So a couple of years ago, I actually started out um, doing forensic work at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner's Office, which is in Tucson, Arizona. And they typically get the majority of UBC or undocumented border cases in the area. And they have been working in conjunction with Calibri Center for Human Rights. Calibri Center for Human Rights uh, was started off by Dr. Robin Reinecke, who has been completely instrumental with all this work. Um, what she does, and you know, when she was part of Calibri Center, is they document and take information from family members of the disappeared or of people who have crossed the border. So for example, let's say I had a family member that crossed the border, I hadn't heard from them in months. I would call somewhere like the Calibri Center and give them information, you know, and they take information such as stature, age, tattoos, what was the last thing this individual was wearing? How old are they? Um, do you know what route they took? So they can get this profile and be able to connect it to any possible decedents at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner's Office. And there have been successful identifications found. So this system does work. Of course, we have to sometimes take DNA samples and all that stuff. But in being there and in engaging in this type of work, I was able to work with Colibri and the PCOME. At the same time, I was able to see the individuals that came in in the process of matching them um, with DNA and also this other data that Colibri was getting. So what I started thinking was, as a forensic practitioner, you know, forensic anthropology, they, they're very interested and involved in the identification and repatriation repatriation process, sorry, which is incredibly important, you know, um, because these families do get their family members back once they're identified and, you know, that closure is worth everything to these families. But I wanted to see what I could kind of give into this, what is important to me. Um, my father and my uncles and cousins have crossed the border themselves uh, through California. Thankfully, they were able to do it successfully. Um, so they went back and forth several times um, through the border. This was <laughs> a couple years back, so it was slightly different. But I put myself in that position and I thought, what would I want to know? What, what could help me? What would I have wanted? So this is kind of where I get into uh, my own bioarchaeological research. And here, again, just a frame of reference, I wanted to share these photos. Um, to the right, you have, you know, an example of the wall. And I think people, when we see it on television, it just seems like this, you know, this wall, and we don't really pay attention much to it, but it's, it's quite treacherous and quite difficult. And even then, even as you can see the landscape, this is a better option for many people. So that can be very telling. To the left, we have what's called the shadow box. Um, and these are some of the items that various individuals carry with them. Um, you see a lot of individuals who cross the border and unfortunately don't make it, have rosaries on them, cell phones, money, uh, photographs, watches, different things, um, either for protection or to find peace within themselves. So again, as a bioarchaeologist, I think these are also very important things to look at, um, not just the skeleton itself. Um, this can really give us insight on who they were, what was important to them and help make those personal connections that I feel are really needed, um, especially in the sciences. So how does bioarchaeology play a role here? For me, I really am interested in structural violence. So how do these governments in power deny individuals their basic rights? Because there is a reason people are wanting to cross. So what can I look at here? And I know something I would have wanted to know, and I constantly ask my own parents and family members is, why do you wanna leave in the first place? What's going on that makes it so horrible to be where you are? And the thing with bioarchaeology is that these markers can sometimes be seen on the skeleton through things like criba orbitalia, 
linear enamel hypoplasias and other types of trauma like dislocations, things like that, because they don't have proper access to healthcare or the proper nutrition. So after a certain period of time, you're gonna start seeing these, these stress markers on a person's skeleton, which is how we can start seeing this in bioarchaeology. What's important to me is connecting the skeletal evidence along with ethnographic evidence. So for example, in terms of the skeleton, we of course look at the biological profile. So we're trying to see things like age, sex, ancestry, stature, trauma, pathology. So sometimes what we can see with a lot of these migrants is that they have a fractured femur or a fractured tibia that wasn't properly healed because they don't have proper access to healthcare and because they may have encountered something violent or it may have been an accident. But at the end of the day, they did not have access to healthcare and they couldn't properly address it. So the infection starts to spread and you start seeing all these little markers show on the skeleton, which is really important for us to know. Another thing that we're looking at is histological analysis. So this is taking a part of the, of the bone and putting it on slides so we could see them through a microscope and look at, for example, osteon count. So we can look at things like age. And we could also look at cortical bone thickness to kind of see growth, if there's any growth stunting and things like that. Because if someone, for example, is not getting the proper nutrition they need, um, it will affect their stature, which is you know, often the case what we see with a lot of these migrants, they're shorter of stature because they don't have these necessary things in order to fully be capable of, of growing to a certain stature or what have you. Now, the ethnographic component is kind of the little, the twist that I think is actually really important as a bioarchaeologist, because I do think that while the skeleton can tell us so much about an individual and what this individual has been through, I think it's important to speak and understand the individuals who are actually doing the crossing that are not deceased, that did make it, or are planning to go on this track because it's able to connect to these two sides of the story and add validity and legitimacy to what's going on in order for them to not just have a voice when they're deceased, but also while they're alive, so we can do something about the root cause of the issue. And with this, understanding the different social landscapes that are really going on here, there's a lot of complexities going here. I know there are a lot of people that think, oh, they're just you know Mexicans coming over the border. That's not the case. There's people from Guatemala, they're doing this double migration. You know, They're having to go all the way through Mexico, going through all the trials and tribulations that are going on there. And again, given enough time, we're gonna see all of this on their skeleton, but hopefully we're able to also talk to individuals before they make this journey in order to connect those dots that we can't necessarily answer with a skeleton alone. So with this all in mind, I know it's, it can be very complicated and there's a lot of ethical concerns with this type of work um, because sometimes when you talk to individuals on the reasonings why they're crossing, you could bring up past trauma. So that is something we do need to consider. And even when looking at the skeleton and making a proper identification, there is trauma to the family members as well. So I bring up this word or this phrase bearing witness because we do as social scientists, as scientists, we need to be aware of the work that we're doing. So there are a lot of NGOs um, like, you know, Texas Human Rights Center um, and at Texas State and Colibri, and they're all doing such wonderful work. But um, I think what a lot of people don't see is that there is a lot of emotional baggage that comes with this work, a lot of stress that comes with this work, not just as a researcher, but on the family members themselves, that we really need to be in tune with when we're doing this work. Because once we put this out there, once we take a DNA sample, um, information is out there and we need to make sure to protect a lot of vulnerable people out there while also giving them that agency to speak on their own behalf, um, to give their own interpretations of what's happening. Um, so it is a really complicated uh, prospect here, but I think bioarchaeology is so well suited, especially with their science background, their social science background, to kind of fuse these two ends together and really make some pretty powerful changes um, at like state and local levels, not just in terms of policy, but to educate people on the severity of the situation and how long lasting these effects can, can be. 
So um, I just wanted to show you a quick picture of kind of the histology process I know I had discussed earlier. Um, I put the, the black boxes is where the bones were um, just out of respect to these individuals. I really didn't want to show their remains. Um, and that's, you know, another thing as bioarchaeologists, we obviously want to see the, the, the remains. We want to know what we're looking at. But I think when it comes to presenting this um, to our larger public, uh, we really need to be cognizant of the fact that um, these were individuals, their family members might still be looking for them. So all this, you know, science, all this, analysis is to help these individuals. It's not for just science itself. We, we are trying to make a difference here, which is where the humanitarian aspect comes along with it. Um, we're not doing this just to write a paper. There, there is a larger picture here um, that bioarchaeologists are really trying to, to take hold of. And um, this was all done, what you're seeing here in Dr. Sabrina Agarwal's lab. She's been instrumental with teaching me how to do these new methods um, because I'm trying to kind of build on what I've done in the past and see what more I can add to this issue of structural violence and identification. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I know I just gave you guys a lot to, to mull over. I'd be very happy to answer, or if you wanna do it in private, I know this is a very sensitive topic. Um, I'd be happy to answer anything by email. Thank you, thank you. That's helpful. And yeah, um, yeah if the listeners want to ask questions again, please feel to put, feel free to put them in the live chat on the in the YouTube window, and uh, they'll reach Martha here. Um, this is really complicated work, as you <laughs> highlighted. And can you talk a little bit about your training and your background? Like, what what kinds of things did you have to train in? To it's, it sounds like this t requires a whole lot of skills from not only the bioarchaeology, but the uh, forensics, so working in the coroner's office, and also obviously social skills to be able to um, talk with, you know, living people about about these. And um, yeah, so what what is your what is your background in training? Yeah, so um, I got my master's at Chico State, so they focus there more on the forensic anthropology side of things as well as bioarchaeology. Um, so I started getting picking up on some of my methods there, and through Chico State, I was able to go to the PCOME which is the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner and use, start with like basic methods, you know, the biological profile kind of see, you know, get my feet wet on what's going on. What are we seeing? Um, what are the complications we're seeing? Things like that. And after that, I kind of knew that I, I wanted to continue with this line of research, but I really wanted to extend my theoretical perspective towards it. And Berkeley and specifically Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Rosemary Joyce and Dr. Wilkie, they, they seemed, you know, I, I knew I had to work there. I knew that they would offer me that, that extra knowledge that I wasn't uh, grasping necessarily. So I've taken these forensic methods and understood how they work in bioarchaeology and how I can use things like mapping, uh, looking at the landscapes, life course theory, how I can apply that to make it broader and for people to understand kind of where I'm coming from and all the different applications and aspects that it affects. Because to me, it seemed that, um, and it still seems to me that um, when people don't live or have any kind of connection to the border or what's going on, and, and this is not just in Mexico, this is overseas as well. You know, we have these issues happening. They tend to take it out of their mind. It's not happening. We don't care. It doesn't bother us. But I think at Berkeley, what I've been able to do is kind of make it wider and be like, this is, these are all the ways it affects us. Like this is a bigger problem than we think it is. This is why we need to address it and kind of taking on these different things. Yeah, and I think you mentioning that uh, talking about studying the skeletons, I mean, this obviously means that there are lots of skeletons being found and that means there are people who are dying who aren't being found for a long time, right? Can you talk about the different, I mean, in order to study the skeleton, you have to have access. Does that mean you're finding people in all sorts of states? I mean, it's... Yeah, so where I was uh, specifically in the Tucson area, we usually, uh, that medical examiner's office just got people in that vicinity, which is a lot of individuals. So sure, sometimes we would, you know, individuals can be found two or three days later, but also we could find someone three years later. Uh, it's It just depends and it depends because um, the terrain is actually quite <laughs> frightening. Um, so there's not people just jogging by every day. Um, usually who, the people who are out there are 
border patrol um, NGOs who are specifically searching for individuals that are in need of help. Um, and also a lot, um, like I mentioned with uh, tribal land, sometimes people that are crossing the border might see a house or something. So they might walk that way. So we also depend on the Tohono O'odham Nation um, saying, hey, we found someone and you know, through that process. So there's different actors at play here which make it even more complicated um, but usually they go into the lab and then there's, you know, a procedure that goes on there and a, a protocol, excuse me, that's a better way to say that protocol that kind of uh, goes in play there. And they have um, two full-time forensic anthropologists um, on staff, Dr. Bruce Anderson and Dr. Jennifer Volner, and a postdoc, uh, Caitlin Bolesberg, who is, they were just amazing to work with, but um, they're, you know, they have so many cases they're looking at every day, um, having to make reports, profiles. Um, there, there are, you know, seasons where we do see more individuals, particularly the summertime where people, you know, are getting dehydrated. Um, and then we don't always get a complete skeleton. So that makes it a tiny bit more complicated because there's only so much information we can get. Um, and ultimately the goal is being able to give them back to their family members. Um, but there is a DNA component to that because of course we're not gonna say, this person had a tattoo, must be, that must be it. You know, we really want to make sure that the individuals are going to their actual family members. So there is a DNA aspect to it, which uh, Colibri has been spearheading as well, um, taking uh, reference samples from the family members and then uh, on the medical examiner side, uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Volner would take DNA bone samples um, on that yeah. part. Yeah. yeah. So for your research, when you're collecting, you have a certain suite of things that you're collecting, I guess, about the skeleton. Do you use um, x-rays or CT scans or how do you, how do you access yeah. that, that information? So I go down to uh, last summer, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go back for a while. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, last summer, what I did was I went and usually they have a, a process there. So all the individuals that they see go through a biological profile. So the forensic anthropologist will note their age, sex, ancestry, stature, any taphonomy, which means anything that's happened post-death. And um, they'll write everything in in their files, right? So I come in, I look at that file, but I also, they're able to pull the remains out and I'm able to kind of give it my own overview, my own measurements. Um, they do take uh, x-rays of the teeth. So that's important for seeing things like age and like stress markers. Um, and sometimes miraculously family members do have x-rays of teeth, which is also incredibly helpful. Um, and then I do like my own um, view and, you know, looking at linear enamel hypoplasia. So my own methods um, use photographs. And then um, what I am able to do is take a histological sample um, using a blade and taking like a small portion of the bone, um, specifically uh, a third or fourth rib if possible and taking it with me and then kind of processing that at the skeletal laboratory at Berkeley. Um, in order to look at it. And um, I was in the middle of my process <laughs> as uh, COVID happened. Wow. So uh, they're, they're waiting for me. But um, th the thing there is we really do want to put those under a microscope, try to see age and see if there's been any kind of stress that can be indicated um, through those analyses. And I don't know if your research is far enough along to be able to comment on this or if you can say what you expect, but did, is what you're seeing in the skeleton and the teeth uh, matching what the, what the ethnographic stories are that you're hearing from people? So I have not gotten to the ethnographic part, but just kind of given the, the history of people I've spoken to, like I, I'm assuming certain things are gonna happen. And here's the, the tricky part. The individuals we see given their exposure to the elements are oftentimes not complete. So we're not able to see these markers that I need to see in order to tell, which is why I think the ethnographic component is so important because there are these blind spots I'm not able to see because they've been scavenged or sun bleached and I, I just can't see. Um, so that, that's kind of the unfortunate part and that's why it is also sometimes pretty difficult to repatriate these individuals because there isn't enough to go on, which is very unfortunate. 
Um, I mean, this whole situation shouldn't be happening in the first right. place, in, in my opinion. So I think that ethnographic component will really shed light more so and give validity. Like, I think they'll validate each other, like what we're missing in the skeletal part and but what we're being told in the ethnographic component of it. So it's it's tough. I do yeah. expect to see these stressors because a lot of these people have experienced prolonged periods of stress, of anxiety, of not knowing where their next meal is coming from, of fear of being prosecuted. Like it's scary. They're frightened. And believe it or not, if this happens too long enough, it's your your body's gonna show it. We're gonna right. be able to see that. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we have a question from listen, a listener about what are the, uh, and you sort of answered this already, but are, what are the major causes of death in the Northern borderlands? They would de expect dehydration, but is there, are there others? Yeah, exhaustion is one. Um, sometimes uh, they run out of water. Sometimes they're tired. And, you know, someone will probably sit down in the shade. And you have to keep in mind, um, a lot of these people are traveling in groups. Um, with, uh, they're called coyotes, which are people that um, you pay and they're supposed to kind of guide you across the border. These people aren't always the nicest people. <laughs> so sometimes what you have is some of these coyotes are just sometimes abandoning them, abandoning them on purpose and just saying, hey, you're going too slow. We got to keep going and just leave people. Sometimes people trip, fall, sprain an ankle. They can't walk. They're not going to wait for them. They're just like, sorry, dude, like we got to keep going. Um, sometimes they're murdered. Um, sometimes people are, you know, I, I don't want to get into the graphics here, but you know, there are, there's sexual assault that can happen. There are so many things that can happen to these individuals. And the second you can't walk on your own, you're kind of seen as a liability and people will, will leave. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, people will leave water with the individual, but it's so hot in the desert. And at nighttime, it gets extremely cold and just these, these exposure, you've been traveling for so long. Um, so that, that is though something that we do look at, like, you know, probable cause of death to, to, to see what might have happened. But usually what we're saying is kind of dehydration, exhaustion, you know, they could only carry so much water. Um, you got to think, you know, they got to carry their clothes, money, water, some snacks. They're walking so many miles in the heat. Um, they have to kind of decide what they want to take. And sometimes, unfortunately, they, they do run out of resources. Um, there are NGOs, um, I don't know if many of you have seen on the news that will leave water in different areas in the desert in case there are people walking by. But then you have these horrible people who um, know that they're there and they'll take the jugs of water and they're uh, just not, uh, not people I'd like to associate no. with, people that do that. So, you know, it's, it's hard out there. It is hard. The elements are incredibly vicious. So again, think about it, how horrible it was your experience back home that this, this is a viable option for you. We really do need to think about that, the, the humane aspect of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, it's really important to hear from people like you who are putting a human face on this. This is, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it in the news and another to hear the actual stories and someone who's working with these individuals. Um, so as in this work, what are the political and emotional and social challenges that you face? That's a big question. Yeah. So politically, I think uh, we all know we're kind of in a, <laughs> mm -hmm. in a, in a not great place. So it, it is hard because a lot of policies and a lot of Politicians who are in the public view can influence the type of funding or the type of like positivity that you're getting towards your work. So a lot of the times this type of work is so severely underfunded. And I think, again, this is me like pushing bioarchaeology, but I think this is how bio bioarchaeology does play such a positive role because we are able to be like, look, there is a scientific component to this, you know, and maybe through that realm really get through this like policy issue, this funding issue. Um, but yeah, sometimes you don't necessarily get the support on uh, university levels, depending on what state you're in, if you're in a more conservative state. So it gets complicated. You could get shut down, you can get arrested as we've seen. Um, all these different factors play. Um, emotionally, of course, it's, it's difficult. Uh, for me, the hardest thing is 
has been when I was with Colibri and you speak with the family, that's, that's really hard because um, you just sense their, their anxiety, their angst, their feeling of hopelessness. It's, it's hard to hear the pain that they're feeling. And a lot of these individuals don't have their own phone. So they're like using a neighbor's phone or going to a grocery store. Like they're going out of their way, spending every last penny they have in order to call organizations like Colibri in hopes of finding their family member. So to me, that was, you know, certainly one of the hardest things, just kind of hearing that it's, it's really hard. It really puts it in perspective. Like this is, this is a big deal to some people. Like these are their lives. These are their family members. And how would we feel if this happened? You know, when you're in a lab setting, I know things can be very, very clinical, but that always kind of brought me back. And I was like, Oh, this is, I really messed up. Like we need to do something. Um, as bioarchaeologists, I think we have so much in our toolkit, and that has been being used, and that I hope to continue to use with, with you know, the ethnographic component of it. So, well, this is extremely important work, and we're really grateful that you've come today to talk to us about it. And we'll be looking forward to seeing how your research unfolds. Um, if you have any links to share, we can add them to the description of the YouTube video so people can read more about this, about your work or about if you have any links that you think just the general public would be interested in, um, in following up with, that would be great. So Martha, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you. Um, and good luck as you continue your work. Um, thank you to the listeners for, for um, listening in today. And if you have a moment um, when you, um, leave if you could respond to the feedback form that is linked from the um, YouTube video description that would be 